Well, depending upon what time of the day you're catching this, good evening or good morning to you. It's good to be with you again. I'm excited that we are back in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Uh, we will be reading a collection of verses if you have your Bible handy. Um, I'm glad that we're kind of getting some continuity here between these last few weeks here in the Gospel Project uh, over the series of these chapters in Luke. And when we do this, it helps us to keep this story uh, somewhat nice and straight. Uh, having said that, though, I, I will be kind of re referencing where some of these verses are collectively found in the Gospel of Matthew. So I'll, I'll try to do that without confusing. I just want to warn you of that now. So that way, if you happen to hear me say something to that effect and you wonder where I am, then it's possible I could be talking about the parallel passages in the Gospel of Matthew. But uh, after we get done reading our verses together, we'll come together for a time of prayer. And then after that, if you want to pause the video, I think most of you kind of know our routine at this point. But just in case there are a few new faces out there who haven't heard me say this before, you might want to get what you need to watch all this in one setting and do so from uh, the comfort of your, your couch or your bed or wherever uh, and listen to all this in one setting just to minimize the risk of me leading to you being confused over something I've said if you're watching this uh, in separate pieces. So I would encourage you perhaps not to do that, but of course, this is at your discretion. So. Anyway, if you'll join me in Luke chapter 12, and we will start in verse 15. He then told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then he told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive, and he thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and goods there. And then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Continuing through verse 22 through 28, then he said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or about the body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a storeroom or a barn, yet God feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than the birds? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? If then you're not able to do even a little thing, then why worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. It's that, if that's how God clothes the grass, which is in the field today and is thrown into the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he do for you, you of little faith? And then now we'll skip ahead to verses 31 through 34. But seek his kingdom and these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old, an inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you'll bow with me in prayer as we ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word and our time together in trying to expound upon it. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that you have given us this chance to be together virtually. It's wonderful that classes are starting to resume something of a normal schedule and trying to meet together in spaces that are prepared for that. And we're grateful, Lord, for those who are willing to take their time to sanitize those areas and try to help keep us clean uh, and protected uh, from the contagion itself. But Lord, for those who have taken it upon themselves to come here together, to learn something, I pray that you would please help me to rightly expound upon your words. I don't want to misrepresent anything you've said with mere human opinion. That would be wrong and sinful of me to do. But Lord, I pray that you'll help us to mine something new from these words. They are very familiar to us, but Lord, you know what kind of danger we run into when we allow things from your word to become too familiar to us in our ears which are so prone to becoming dull, and of course our hearts to becoming hardened and calloused to the friction that these words were meant to provide every time we come 
into contact with them and engage them as if we are reading them afresh for the first time. Help us to do that again today. I pray that you will open our ears, our eyes to see and hear with, that we would be part of that crowd that you reference in the gospel when you say, for those of you who have ears, let that be us today. Let our hearts be open to your word to hear what you have to say. May we be challenged and may we be eager to step up to that challenge that we may please you in being obedient servants. We ask this in your name that you may be glorified. Amen. So, I don't really have too much of a point of contention to make with the way that our points are uh, brought together in the, the material that we're learning from our Sunday School uh, text. I just simply say that as a means of saying sometimes when you have material arranged around a topic or a theme and verses are somewhat sandwiched together, but the continuity of the passage is broken up um, and those verses are brought together in a more abbreviated way, it's so easy for us to lose the context and the meaning of the passage. And I won't say that that is really the fault of the, the writers and editors of the material. They obviously have a point to make, a series of points, actually. They give us three with every lesson. But let's face it, this is certainly not meant to be offensive to anyone. I am included in this as each of you are as well. But if we're being honest with ourselves, we're usually lazy and slothful with our study patterns. And we probably won't take the time to actually sit down and read to glean from the larger context so that we can understand. But it, as we come together now, I consider that part of my obligation and privilege in teaching you is to try to help broaden our minds to what that context is. But to do that, of course, got to break away from the Sunday school material and uh, let the verses say what they say, but again, insert them back into the context that they come from so that we can really get to the root of what Jesus is saying. If we're being honest, um, another thing that I would say that we're probably all guilty of um, is, as I was saying during our prayer time, being somewhat calloused and dull of hearing with respect to these words, because just like the Lord's Prayer that we were learning last week, or probably what is more accurately referenced as the model prayer, that's something that has been said and utilized so many times that those words, if you stop and think about it, uh, to many of us are probably almost dead, that they've been used and strained to the point where they really don't maintain much of the original meaning for many of us and the way that we use them. Many of us probably don't even understand the way that they fit into the context because oftentimes the way that we encounter them They've been completely removed from the context. They've been stripped bare of any meaning uh, in the verses that precede and succeed that passage that surround it in its entirety and give it the meaning and significance that Jesus meant for it to. It's been sanitized of anything other than uh, just what we would glean from it at face value and usually, or usually utilized at, at sporting events or something else like that as a means of trying to garner God's favor, I guess, and uh, his favoritism for your team over the other team. I know that was the case when I was playing high school football. But uh, nevertheless, the point being um, to put these back in the context they come from will help us better understand what Jesus meant by these words. And hopefully if we've achieved a, a measure of success, that it will remove a lot of the enigma and mystery surrounding them such that we can understand how we're to utilize this truth in our journey of faith and adequately please the Lord through faith versus just trying to use these uh, verses to do something with, such as perhaps pray in a way that will gain what we want or whatever the case may be, depending upon what gospel you're reading these verses in. And having said that, let me just use that as a bridging segment into my next brief little point in this introduction, and that is the material that we're learning today from Luke's gospel, the context of that really spans all the way back to the ending of chapter nine. 
and most of the context of chapters 10, 11, and 12 can be paralleled and transposed against the context of Matthew chapters 6 and 7, and also a portion of chapter 10, and some of the events that go in between uh, chap the end of chapter 7 and chapter 10 in Matthew are included elsewhere in Luke's narrative, but outside of the scope of what these verses are. So much of what we have read here is included in what is often referred to as the Sermon on the Mount and what Jesus said in Matthew, 9, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But I want to bring us back to Luke chapter 9 so that we can see where this begins. And I'll par a little, uh, parallel a little bit of what we're talking about with Matthew's gospel, as I said before, but try to do so in a way that hopefully doesn't confuse, just to try to help illustrate some of the subtle differences between the way Matthew and Luke utilizes this material and the points that they're trying to make with it. Forgive me, I have a hair on my face and I have to keep scratching my nose, I think. So at the end of Luke chapter 9 and verse 51, we read this the last time we were together, when the days were coming to a close for him to be taken up meaning Jesus' ascension back to heaven, he determined to journey to Jerusalem. And older English translations of scripture would say that he set his face toward Jerusalem. And that is a straight throwback to Isaiah 50, where it's speaking of Messiah kind of setting his face very hard toward the task that God has given him, almost like flint. And this is, of course, Jesus being resolved to do what it is that God has tasked him with. And that is, of course, to come and inaugurate the kingdom, but that task really can't come to its full fruition until Jesus has sown his body in the in the ground, uh, having died. That, of course, is something that Luke actually uses for us later on as uh, a means of Jesus explaining literally a day or two before he goes to the cross that, again, this is what he came to do. Without that, the kingdom itself has no significance. It has no meaning. And what he intends to accomplish cannot happen until he fully destroys the strongholds of Satan in this world and that ultimately everyone is set free from the captivity of their sin and its oppressiveness over us, our slavery to it, right? And once we are set free from that, then we can enter into this new creation that he has heralded. So anyway, he sent messengers ahead of him and on the way they entered a village of the Samaritans. So he's journeying in that direction. And if you remember some time ago, as I was kind of laying out the construct of Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 9 pretty much serves as that point of transition from his Galilean-centric ministry, which is heavily uh, focused upon in the first portion of the gospel. And now he is, as he's turning his face to go toward Jerusalem, he's leaving the northern area of Jewish population in the Galilee, and he's coming southward. And this journey is going to take some time. It's not going to be a two or three day kind of ordeal. Uh, but as Luke is transitioning us up to that point where the triumphal entry actually occurs in these chapters between around nine up through about 19 ish, um, we get to that point. Jesus is stopping at several different points along the map, and we're seeing lots of engagement between him and his disciples. And he's using them in ways that he hasn't used them before. What Matthew would say kind of happens earlier on in Jesus's ministry. Luke puts a little bit more toward the end. Not entirely sure which one is more chronologically accurate, and that doesn't matter. Again, I would reference the, our conversation in the past about the modularity of the gospel and the way ancient writers use this material, and they would sh uh, move things around, shifting them for the sake of illustrating what their theme is. And as you've heard me say before also, that chiastic structure of Luke, starting with Jesus as an outsider in Galilee, moving into Jerusalem to kind of storm the castle, if you will, and take Jerusalem away from the religious elites who've held it captive under the sway of um, really Satan being the puppet master, pulling the strings, basically, and uh, propping up something of a false religion under the guise and pretense of diligent and ardent obedience to the law, albeit to the letter and not the spirit, as Jesus often points out to the Pharisees. So that's what Jesus is doing. And as Jesus transitions over to Luke chapter 10, he starts with sending the 72 out. And if I recall correctly, Matthew only gives us the sending out of the 12. And he's doing that in keeping with the fact that, as you've heard me talk about before, Matthew makes it a point among his many themes 
to paint Jesus in the light of being the true son of God, which of course he is, but that means redeeming all of the narrative of the broken history of Israel and how they failed God at multiple points, beginning with the Exodus through the wilderness wanderings into the conquest era of Canaan, the period of the judges, and on through the, uh, the time of the monarchy with many of the other prophets in their ministries as well. And the choosing of the 12, commissioning them as emissaries and then sending them out in pairs to engage each of the towns throughout Israel and preaching to them, the kingdom of, of God is at hand. It's here, it's now validating that message with all the different miracles and signs that Jesus has been performing. And then coming back, Luke gives us that same narrative, albeit he gives us the sending of the 12 earlier on in uh, Luke 9. Now he gives us a different part of the narrative in which a group of 70 uh, are sent out or 72, depending upon the translation you're reading. Either way, it's illustrative of the fact that now the nations are going to be uh, approached with the gospel. Not at this point. They're still being sent out just to the towns of Israel. But it is preemptively illustrating how the 70 nations from Babel will be uh, reached out to by the sending of the 70 as the time approaches when Jesus ascends to heaven and the church begins in Jerusalem. And then from there, they spread out to Judea, Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. Right. And so as, after they go, they come back to Jesus and they start talking about all the things that they encountered and enjoyed. And then Jesus is praising the father at the fact that he has revealed these things unto the innocent ones, right? Meaning more or less children, not the wise and intelligent who whose cups are so filled with their own sense of understanding and the pride that they have in thinking that they understand God, the law, his will. And of course, they put themselves in this place of opposition against all of these whom they think are the accursed and the outcasts but are also children of Abraham and participants in covenant promise. And Jesus is reaching out to that crowd instead of reaching out to them. Of course, he has his compassionate moments where he indeed expresses love toward the crowds of the Pharisees and the scribes and so forth. And some of them do engage Jesus with open minds, seemingly enlightened by the Holy Spirit and willing to listen to the gospel message that Jesus is preaching. But for the most part, the vast majority of them are completely closed off to it. But anyway, Jesus uh, starts this portion of teaching many of these crowds that are starting to now gather. It's almost like that scene in Rocky, right, where when he starts off from his apartment and he's running down the road and as he's getting closer to the finishing point of his run, where he runs up those steps, eventually where that statue is erected to him at, right, then those kids start seeing him run and they want to join in on it because they know he's been training hard for this great big match he's got going on with Apollo. And before it's all said and done, and he's got a ton of kids all up and down those stairs and on the terraces and whatnot that are just jumping up and down with him. That's kind of what's going on here. Albeit the theme music is absent, but uh, Jesus is building quite a bit of groundswell. He left with that small band of followers, more than just the 12 from that area of focus in Galilee. And as he's making stops in different areas, more and more people now are being attracted to this itinerant preacher who has been preaching and had been performing all sorts of signs and miracles uh, that people have heard about. And they have listened to the rumors circulating around who he could be, what it, what's going on. And if he's actually going to Jerusalem, then a showdown must be about to happen. And if indeed he is Messiah, the long awaited king, we want to see what that's about. Right. And what's going to happen. And that builds up to that moment of crescendo in Luke 19, where now they're moving from Jericho and they're not that far away from Jerusalem. They really just have to get over the Mount of Olives and they'll be there. And they are thinking in their minds that the kingdom of heaven is just going to appear at any moment. Right. But apparently they've been missing or have come in a little bit too late in the game to understand all of what Jesus has said. And while Jesus is broadcasting these words for all to hear and he intends for anyone whom the spirit is speaking to to gain something from that message, most of this content is really meant for his 12 that he is preparing for their ministry after he's gone. And through that, we get the parable of the Good Samaritan and so forth. And Jesus is illustrating what true love for God and your neighbor really is all about. And then we get this little anecdotal story about Mary and Martha. And when Jesus is you know, relaxing in the privacy of their home as a guest of their invitation and Martha it's a little troubled about the fact that Mary seemingly is so lazy and just sitting at Jesus's feet, not wanting to help her, that she kind of lambastes both Mary and do anything about this. And 
Jesus says, Martha, your sister is concerned about what is most important, whereas you are concerned about the things that you think are important, but are really not. She's chosen the right thing. I won't take that away from her. And just building more so upon the idea of who is here now teaching, we need to give heed to his words. And moving forward into what is about to happen in Jerusalem, there's a lot that Jesus has already said that really needs to be brought to bear and remembered. And there's a lot that he is saying now that is going to come into play after his death has happened. And it seems for them that the world has completely turned upside down. And then we get into the context of what we were talking about last week with the model prayer and the concept of asking and searching and knocking. But we have to attach everything that I've just very briefly summarized, but what we've already kind of dived into in weeks past and what we've looked at in, uh, last week with the mindset of what Luke is telling us that Jesus is doing, and that is inaugurating the kingdom. Luke, just like Matthew and Mark, has shared the fact that when Jesus began his ministry, he began to preach to the people, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So as he's announcing this, he starts to validate that by performing these miracles and these signs amongst the people, mostly amongst those groups of the outcasts, whether it be those who are sick or demon possessed, those who are actually poor in the economic sense, or just poor in the social sense that they may be of well stature or well off stature, but because of the fact that they are looked down on due to the fact that they work a certain trade or profession that other people don't like or don't find very savory, or they think is an outright complete rebellion against the law of God, Jesus is reaching out to those. It garners negative attention against him uh, by the religious elites, but of course it gives him a, a, an opportunity to engage them over what the law really intends uh, for everyone to be pictured as with respect to our sin against God. No one's righteous. If they were just willing to see that and embrace it, they would understand his movement a lot better, but they're too hard of heart at this point to do so. They hear, but they don't understand. They see, but they don't really perceive, right? As Isaiah said, will be the case. And so <clears throat> Jesus then in Luke 9 sends the 12 out and he tells them to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the beginning of uh, Luke 10, I, as I just mentioned, sends out the 72. He tells them also preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So all of this is meant to be tied up in that vein of thinking. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so what else is Jesus saying about the kingdom? And as I said briefly earlier in the lesson, the content of what we are talking about here from Luke 10, 11, and 12, a lot of that is shared with us over in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, perhaps more so 6 and 7. But because of that is two-thirds of what is called the Sermon on the Mount, as we referenced many weeks ago before, when Jesus in the context of Matthew 4 moving into Matthew 5 begins that sermon, what did we see Jesus do? We saw him being baptized by John in Matthew 3, tempted by Satan in the wilderness, led to do so by the Holy Spirit, delivered through that again by the Holy Spirit, having been ministered to by those angels now ready to begin his ministry. And there's some action that happens there that's abbreviated for us and taken out of that by Matthew's perspective. And Matthew just kind of puts Jesus in the same limelight as Moses going up on a mountain beginning to teach, right? Don't want to rehash all that. Just to remind us the fact that that's what Matthew's thinking and how he's painting Jesus in this picture. But he's tacking that on with the idea in mind of Jesus beginning, beginning to preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now that the kingdom is here, what does it mean to be a citizen in the kingdom? That is the unifying theme of all of what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is all about what he expects his subjects to act, or how he expects them to act, what he expects them to do, the way he wants them to express their faith, how they are to do kingdom work everywhere that they go. He even gets that out into the weeds with respect to praying, fasting, tithing, worshiping everything. And that's no different from what Luke is doing here. He has removed the Moses motif to an extent, at least in the way that Matthew has painted it. And he is giving us a different backdrop. He's painting for us a different picture through a different lens, but he's still doing so with the idea in mind that this is a cosmic kingdom. 
It's not just the kingdom that's coming to Israel, which is a little bit more Matthean in nature, but he's giving us the idea that this is a kingdom meant for all mankind. And if all humanity is going to be united alongside the Jews in this new creation, in this kingdom that will never end, as Daniel predicted, and Jesus is now coming to make living, breathing, historic reality for everyone, what does it mean to be in the kingdom? And he gives us uh, a, a slightly tweaked version of some of the things that Jesus said. And we don't have time to go into all those subtle areas where some things are taken out as far as uh, phrases uh, that are different between Matthew and Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. And it's not even orchestrated as that really in Luke's gospel. It's more or less kind of Jesus saying these things as he's traveling. Not that Luke says that, so there's not really a, a point of contradiction between the two. And it is entirely possible, perhaps, that Jesus may be reiterating things he said at an earlier time. That what actually happened in Matthew chronologically was repeated, reiterated again here in Luke's gospel at a different time. It doesn't really matter either way we look at it. It would stand to reason that Jesus as a traveling itinerant preacher would have used many of his sermon illustrations again they we would have uh, reiterated many of the points he said in sermons and or private lessons at people's homes uh, in public sermons when he was preaching, right? That he didn't have to reinvent the wheel every time he uh, said what he did because after all, many people didn't understand or grasp the essence of what he said the first time around. Saying it a few more times, dropping that for his disciples perhaps would help them allow that to sink in and uh, give the, the Spirit something to really work with to help open their minds to what he's talking about there, right? And so through the rest of Ma uh, Luke 11, just to kind of briefly summarize much of what's being said there, Jesus goes to the concept of the house being divided and the idea that they're causing or accusing him of divide, uh, casting out demons through the power of Satan himself and how silly and illogical that is. Um, and then he talks about how, you know, this adulterous generation is seeking for a sign, but the only thing that's going to be given to them is the sign of Jonah. And then he uh, references the, the lamp of the body. And just to spend a tiny little bit of time on this, when he says, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a cellar or a basket, but on a lampstand so that those who come in and may see its light, your eye is the lamp of the body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. I just mean to say this is coming on the very tail end of what he said with respect to the sign of Jonah. He's reaching out to this sinful generation and he's telling them, you want a sign, this is the only sign that's going to be given. If your eye can't see what it is that is so obvious and apparent in front of you, perhaps it's your eye itself that's evil. And if your eye is evil, then think about this. Your entire being is filled with darkness and not light. If you're not seeing the things that are so obvious to those who are rejoicing in front of you right now over what God has done and the works that God has manifest in front of you, you need to ask those critical questions as to why you don't. And of course, many of them perhaps would. And then Jesus goes on to denounce the Pharisees and talking about their measures of hypocrisy and so forth, because one of those Pharisees invited him to come in and eat with him. But Jesus doesn't wash his hands in the prescriptive way before they sit down and recline to eat. And then Jesus goes on to talk about how the Pharisees are washed on the outside through their external religious expressions. But on the inside, they are full of death, greed and hypocrisy. And of course, in insulting them, they they take him to task in saying that you realize what you're saying insults not just the Pharisees, but the scribes, too. And then Jesus turns uh, his vent of wrath on them for a second. And then after that, the plot is hatched to start to put things in place to kill Jesus, to permanently silence him because of the way that he treats them and the things that he is saying and the way that the crowds are following him. So I wish I had more time to really spend to kind of help summarize those things and pull it all together for us in a nice, succinct way to help us understand what I hope at this point you've gotten, and that is Jesus is preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He has sent out two different groups uh, increasing in number to uh, address the towns of Israel and to preach the same message, to perform the same miracles, to prepare them for what is going to happen after he leaves them. He's already predicted to his disciples twice now that he is going to be delivered over to 
the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of Israel, and they are going to accuse him falsely. He is going to wind up being delivered over to the Gentiles. They understand that to be the Roman powers, and he will be crucified. But ultimately, he will be raised from the dead, right? And so, again, preparing them for what is about to happen when that Jerusalem showdown occurs, and then again, ministry that will ensue afterwards. But he's also helping them to understand as part of all of that, what they are going to face. And so the earlier portion of chapter 12 that we didn't cover in the verses that we read, I will briefly summarize here. At the beginning of chapter 12, to bolster what I said earlier, meanwhile, a crowd of many thousands came together. Just picture that in your mind. Jesus out in the open here in the space between Galilee and Judea, kind of hugging up against the skirts of Samaria, if you will. And now thousands of people are littering the landscape to hear what he's got to say. And he began to, his, to say to his disciples first, remember at the conclusion of uh, Luke 11, he's just spent time in the house of a Pharisee lambasting the Pharisees because they chided him for not washing in the proper prescriptive way. And then, of course, being heavily insulted by the things that he said. He does the same thing with the scribes, trying to help them see their, their sinful plight. They don't want to. Now they begin to hatch this plan to want to kill them. But Jesus knew that would happen, as he already predicted, right? And so now that he knows his time is going to be coming to an end soon before the cross does occur, he's now wanting to illustrate a few final points. And that is, let's start with this. Hey, guys, I need you to listen. <laughs> the Pharisees, they have a very rich nature of hypocrisy. It's like leaven in a dough, a lump of dough that just leavens or permeates, grows throughout that dough until it has fully saturated the dough itself, causing it to rise. And he says, guys, I need you to know that there's nothing that will not be uncovered and nothing that will not be made known. People will or already perceive their hypocritical ways, but yet there are many who do follow the Pharisees seeing them as being the most righteous among you. But I need you to understand that the things that happen behind closed doors, the deals that they make to try to placate the Romans, um, and of course, the things that they do to try to help garner more power or hold on to the power that they have, all of this will be made known as Jesus in the very near future is going to be predicting the fall of Jerusalem. And uh, it will not be the ultimate fate of Pharisaism, but Pharisaism will suffer a big, huge black eye uh, molding blow uh, at the time when the Romans come and actually lay siege to Jerusalem. And for a time, of course, they will lose a little bit of clout before they wind up gaining quite a bit more with the waylaying of the priestly class because the temple has been destroyed and they don't really have a job anymore. And so the Pharisees are the one that kind of step in and fill that power vacuum and void that has been created. But that's a lesson for a different time. Anyway, therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light and what you have whispered in an ear in private rooms will be proclaimed from the housetops. So the things that they try to keep secret, they they try to hold with lid tightly closed over it to keep hush hush so that nobody will know. But of course, God knows. But I have not told you things for you to keep under cover of darkness. I want the things that I have whispered to you in private, in dark rooms and behind closed doors to be shouted from the rooftops. I don't want you to keep any of this information to yourself. The time will come when you will have full reign to preach this message with absolute total liberty to everyone whom the Spirit is drawing unto you for you for them to hear this, right? And then he goes on to say in verse 4, I say to you, my friends, don't fear those who can kill the body but can't do anything more. He's telling them, as he's already predicted, persecution will come. You need to be prepared for that. And you don't need to fear those who will promise through their threatenings that they will indeed take your life. And if you see that they will take the life of the Son of Man, albeit they can only do so because that power has been given to them from above and he will take his life back as he tells us in John's gospel. But even if they do put you to death, they don't have the ultimate final say, right? God does. He's the one that has the ability to destroy both body and soul in hell. And for those who are willing to condemn you to such a fate, should they fail to repent, certainly that will be their fate. You have God because you do. You know where your eternal home is and what your eternal reward will be, right? And then he goes on to warn them that should anybody fail to acknowledge the Son of Man before other men, 
then he also will fail to acknowledge that person before the angels and before God himself, right? And so that's the backdrop behind what is going on here when Jesus jumps into this parable about the rich fool, as it's uh, kind of termed in some of our translations. We shouldn't disjoint or disconnect this teaching about this man in this parable as if to say this is just a lesson that Jesus is teaching on finances. That, that That's not it at all. If we think that, then we are totally missing the point. Yes, I would agree wholeheartedly with what many other commentators and theologians have said with respect to the idea that Jesus does say more about economics, finances, wealth thematically than he does about hell, about heaven, uh, eternal life, or even the atonement. Um, if you combine the sum total of everything that is said or expressed over all four gospels. Yes, that's true. And that would be a great little bridging point to jump into perhaps a sermon or a lesson or maybe even a book about financial management and so forth. And I wouldn't say that that would be a wrong thing to do. However, we again run a great risk at failing to understand what Jesus is truly illustrating if we just want to come at this from the perspective of Jesus is trying to teach on money. And that's not the case at all. What he is helping them to understand and see is, is guys, I need you to get it that when I'm gone, this is what your responsibility is going to be. I'm preparing you for something far greater. The lives that you've left, as you have said, Peter, you have left all to follow me. What reward will there be for you? I've told you already, anyone who has left houses or lands or parents or uh, families for my sake will gain a hundredfold more both in this life and the next. You will not lose out. But that doesn't mean that you gain in an economic sense, not the sense that I'm telling you where you, you had one house, now you have a hundred houses, but that your family will exponentially multiply as you enter into my family, the one I'm calling out from all of Adam's race to become part of this new creation and this kingdom that I have come to inaugurate. You will all be connected as brothers and sisters, no one greater than anyone else and every one servant to one another, right? That flies in the face of what the thinking of this particular man in this parable is, who he, when he looks at this uh, scenario of, wow, I mean, I've never had a crop yield like this. This is fantastic. What am I going to do with all this? It would be terrible for a, a portion that I wasn't prepared for to go to waste. So let's just tear down these barns, build bigger ones. And man, I'm going to be set. Once I finally sell all of this, I'll have enough money that I can retire I can live fancy, foot, foot, foot loose and uh, fancy free. I'll have everything I need that I can tell my soul, hey, take it easy. You've got good stored up for many years. You have prepared yourself for the future and perhaps even generations that come from you afterwards. So be happy. And the Lord comes to him in a, uh, that night and he says, you fool. Now your soul will be demanded of you. Why? Because he failed to be rich toward God, instead preparing for himself treasure in this life. And yes, I would also say and reiterate what's been said many times over that that is not a means of saying that God is against anyone having wealth. But certainly the disciple of Jesus will have a far easier time at managing the cares of this world by living somewhat minimalistically. Now, I'm not trying to ascribe to the idea of some sort of hermetic lifestyle or some sort of monkish uh, way of living in which we just withdraw from every sense of asceticism in this world and renounce our possession over everything and just live with really nothing more than the claim to the clothes on our back. But the less that we are entrenched in building our own kingdoms and something of a legacy that will survive us and preparing generations that come after us, because Let's face it, friends, it seems like these cycles of economic prosperity followed by woe seem to happen on a much more accelerated pace than I remember my parents talking about or even their parents before them, where it seemed like you at least had a few decades or longer in between. And now it seems like we just never really ever get out of one small recession or whatever they want to term that in the financial markets and on the news waves. 
uh, until we're start, we're already talking about the imminence and unavoidability of the next one and what preparations we'll make. And we want to think about trying to settle our finances in such a way that we can, of course, have money to make it through our golden years uh, when we're retired and have pulled away from the working in the public sector to enjoy what time we have left. And then hopefully leave a little something for our kids or, of course, trying to prepare them for college. I won't say any of that's wrong, but any of that could be gone and lost like that, you know, depending on how we've invested that money or whatever the case might be. All of that is in the Lord's hands and he will do with it as he will. What he intends for us, and I think is what is easily encapsulated there in that phrase, rich toward God, is the understanding that he blesses us with these things, these resources economically so that we can be open and available for radical and free, generous giving, uh, much in the vein of what Jesus is talking about just a few chapters in the future from this in Luke 16, when he gives a parable of what's often called either the dishonest or the shrewd manager or whatever your translation may have. But the idea is there's this servant who has not behaved in a very respectable way with respect to his master. And he realizes that he's about to lose his job soon because the master is kind of aware of his slothfulness. And so he hatches a scheme to try to use some of the clientele uh, that is indebted to his master for the things that they purchase from him. He alters their bills so that they won't be so indebted to his master. And he's garnering friendships so that when he loses his job, he'll have some people who are willing to work with him and trade and take care of him. Right. And Jesus uses that as a means of saying, don't behave like that guy. But I understand that through his shrewdness, he was able to use the contacts that he had made in order to help prop himself up so that when he lost this job, it wasn't complete and total economic uh, ruin uh, and something that would follow him and overshadow him for the rest of his life. Therefore, use your contacts, use your friendships that you have garnered and use your resources economically. Exploit those things so that you have an avenue and a forum to tell people the gospel. And that, of course, is what we are seeing being expressed by Jesus here. Being rich toward God is using everything you have and giving it away as if it means nothing to you. Use it while you can, but don't use it to simply make your plight in life and your means better and then continue on that trajectory and forget about what you could use it to do to further the kingdom. Absolutely not. Instead, use it in a wise way so that when the opportunity presents itself and we should be looking for these opportunities, not like holding to this stuff tight fistedly and Okay, God, so if, if you want me to give some to him, I'll give some to them. But please don't ask me to give any more. Absolutely not. That we are saying, God, it's all yours. I can't wait to see what you do with this stuff. I mean, I can't believe you give it to me. I don't want to spend it on anything that I don't need. God, you provide everything I need. God, you're so good. You're so gracious. Take some of this. Take it all. Give what you want. Show me where I can sow this so that it can do something for your kingdom's sake, whether that's locally, whether that's globally, friends, God will make those things open and available to us. And you can't possibly begin to outpace God in giving. And if he sees that you're faithful and willing and not tight fisted, who knows how much money he'll allow to pour through our hands and what little tiny fraction of it we'll get to hold on to for good and pleasurable living, but not to the extremists that now we're becoming gluttonous with that. And I don't simply mean in just eating, but gluttonous in so many other ways and using that for our own good, faring sumptuously, as is the King, King James terminology. But again, opening ourselves up for radical and generous giving and doing so in such a way that it pierces a person's soul and they want to know what has prompted such. Why would we consider doing that for them, whatever the circumstance might be, right? And then uh, we use that as a means of sharing the gospel. And how many books do you know have been written in regards to that? If you don't know of one, I suggest you find one and maybe read some of those anecdotal stories. And briefly, as Jesus moves on, if we understand that concept, then when we jump into 22 through 34 and this idea of what Jesus is saying about anxiety and understanding that our lives are more than just the food we put in our bodies uh, or the drinks we nourish ourselves with in order just to simply survive the clothes that we put on our backs. 
and that if we look to the things around us in God's good creation, the ravens, the sparrows, the things that people just simply take for granted or are sold in marketplaces for literally pennies on the shekel, uh, or the grass in the field that literally is good for nothing than being the fodder that the livestock eat or is just simply cut down and thrown away into the fire during the winnowing seasons uh, uh, at harvest time, right? That God highly values those aspects of his creation and he adequately provides for them every single day through what we would typically call common grace, just as much as God provides for those who we would see as being wicked and we understand through their lifestyle, their choices, their actions and behaviors, they clearly are evil and have no relationship with the Lord. And yet the Lord allows rain to fall on their crops and the sun to shine on their land as much as he does for those who diligently serve him in open sincerity um, and faith, right? Jesus is not simply just addressing the idea of, hey, so life is stressful and yeah, you definitely will have some pressing concerns with respect to your health, growing and raising your children and trying to prepare them for the hardships of life. And you're hoping that you can get them through those childhood, adolescent and teenage years on into those early adult years without making too many terrible mistakes of which there may be very long lasting consequences that come from them and prepare them for life having imparted some degree of wisdom and that's just a small little slice of the pie right that his life and all the other things that you have to concern yourself with with respect to working a job and trying to advance in your career and providing enough for retirement or setting enough aside right and then uh, just trying to maintain an adequate state of health until you can get to that point so that hopefully your body's not riddled with disease in the last few decades of your life and you get to enjoy something of that he's not talking about any of that in this uh, section, we could perhaps extrapolate the idea to apply to some of those things. But friend, that is not what this is meant to be understood as, uh, and nor is it something that should just be plastered to some sort of either desktop calendar or motivational devotional book or whatever for the sake of helping us understand that, hey, yes, we're anxious. That needs to be surrendered unto the Lord. Jesus is saying, look, your time here on earth is not for you to be investing in building your own kingdoms, friend. Your time here is to enter into the kingdom. Do you notice how Jesus never tells us to build the kingdom, either, either his kingdom or certainly we're to understand that we're not to be busy about building our own kingdoms, but we are to enter his kingdom. We are to pursue his kingdom. We are to, as he says here at the end of this uh, passage that we read for our third point, to seek the kingdom. Matthew's gospel would go on to say that we are to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto us. Meaning in the background, God is taking care of all of these details. What are we supposed to be focused on day in and day out? Kingdom work. Kingdom work. That we have money to use for the sake of helping advance the kingdom through us being openly willing to share what we have with those all around us as the spirit prompts us to do so if the spirit isn't prompting you to do so and yet you can clearly see there is injustice or all around us there are needs that need to be met then the question should be asked friend why aren't you being prompted to is that because you're afraid to open up your purse your billfold uh, your pocket, your bank account, you're, you're afraid to open up your home? Are you afraid to make yourself vulnerable? That's good. It's good that you are. If you're willing to embrace that fact, then at least we've started on the road to recovery from the problem that is the addiction to your and my material possessions. Friends, we have these things because we are stewards of the resources God has given so that we can utilize these things so that through us, he advances his kingdom and we in the process are seeking his kingdom. We are seeking it by seeking his righteousness. And what is the righteousness of God? As Matthew has put this in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, we go to the material that precedes that. And in the concourse of Matthew 5 and 6, Jesus is telling us what God's righteousness looks like as he's rehashing the law and telling us, you heard it from the mouth of our ancestors all the way back to Moses. Don't commit adultery. But I'm telling you, if you look with lust, on through all that, he is telling us to pursue God's righteousness is to empty the heart of lustful thinking, of hardness of heart that leads to adultery. 
of being willing to lie for your own selfish and sinful gain instead of being a truth teller. Don't prop up what you say by swearing with oaths. Instead, say what you say, mean what you say, understand you represent the truth, which is who I am, right? As I embody it and you carry my name, so you represent the truth. And then don't retaliate against those who use you or those who would purposefully abuse you. Instead, I'm not telling you to be a doormat for anyone, but what I am saying is that you reach out in love and even offer up yourself beyond what they have done to you. For that Roman soldier who wants to press gang you into carrying his equipment for a mile and the whole way is cursing you as a Jew, saying how much of a dog you are and how much he hates your God and how much he would put all of you to the sword if he could. And yet when you get to the end of that mile, instead of throwing his things down, walking away because he can't force you to go another step according to Roman law and decree, and then you curse that Roman under your breath as you walk away from him, Instead, you look at him and you say, man, you've had a really tough day. I know you're tired and I'm sure your feet probably hurt. Mine do too, but I tell you what, I'm willing to carry this stuff to your doorstep. What? Radical, generous giving. Doesn't have to just simply be of money. It could even be of your time and your energy, friends, of literally everything that we have. And so if we are busy about kingdom work, then we don't have time to be anxious about the things that are really nothing more than just simple distraction points. That's it. Concerning ourselves with the things that we'll put on our, our on our bodies or even in our bodies can certainly be not only a point of distraction, but even idolatrous to an extent. If we're just simply spending all the money that we get or most of it on readdressing our wardrobe or the fitness industry, right? I mean, I wouldn't throw myself into the arena of being a fitness buff, but I, I do love uh, and I really appreciate working out. I, I get something of a therapeutic and cathartic uh, benefit from doing that. I enjoy the concept of fitness, and I think there are a lot of tangents and parallels that go along with a lot of scriptural points, <laughs> even though physical uh, training is of little benefit, but godliness, spiritual training and discipline, of course, is for eternal benefit, right? But my point is, is that there are all kinds of money that can be sunk into doing something like that to try to build and sculpt a body that in the end won't last and will succumb to the shroud that covers us all, right? Instead, those assets and resources could very easily and more profoundly be used for the sake of getting the gospel message to the nations and preparing myself for that service each and every day that when I wake up and I go to my job, I realize I've got this job because God has strategically planted me here for the sake of telling these people in this circle who Jesus is and illustrating and representing to them every day what it truly means to be a Christian. Not someone that's, you know, been privileged and blessed to be raised here in the South and knows what hospitality is all about and just being a good general Christian to other people by being nice and stuff like that. Jesus even says, do not the Gentiles, or in some translations, the pagans also uh, treat well those who treat them with good regard. And they don't even have the law. They don't have the light and instruction that God has given. And yet they know to be nice to those who are nice to them. So there's nothing that we are gaining or uh, expressing in a godly way to other people just simply by being nice. Friend, it goes far beyond that in modeling the mindset and the attitude of Jesus. And so time is running out. I don't have as much time as I would like to go through the rest of the content of this chapter because there's a lot left to say. But let me just simply sum it up in the context of verses 35 through 40, which I will read those to you and we'll comment briefly. But be ready for service. Have your lamps lit. You are to be like people waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door for him at once, at once. Blessed will be the servants who the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will get ready have them recline at the table, and then he will come and serve them. Something completely unheard of and would never be expected on the part of the servant in relation to the master. If he comes in the middle of the night or even near dawn and finds them alert, blessed are those servants. But know this, 
and he kind of switches gears a little bit in saying this, but if the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also be ready because the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Let me just briefly uh, point out the fact that every time our tendency is to think that every time we read something from the words of Jesus about his coming or any kind of reference to a wedding or a banquet or a feast, that every one of those has to be some sort of euphemistic reference to his second coming. And that's not always the case. Jesus is like he does in many cases, just simply using common readily available themes from everyday life for them to understand what it is that he has already taught them. And that is, you are to serve. Don't be anxious for the things that are going to be very well attended to by your father in heaven. Just as he takes care of the birds in the air, the grass of the field, he will take care of every one of these things. So you needn't worry about it. Just commit yourself to this covenant relationship that God has called you into and to enter the kingdom, pursue the kingdom, proclaim the kingdom, right? Be ready for service. Have your lamps lit, not waiting for Jesus to return to the earth. That's not what he's saying. That's not what this concept of a wedding banquet is meant to illustrate. The idea is that weddings in this ancient context could last for several days. And the master did not tell his servants, yep, I will be home at 11 o'clock sharp. So make sure that somebody's there ready to answer the door. No, he could be gone for two or three, four or five, maybe on into a week's worth of days before eventually he comes home. Now, one might think, well, that's a little inconsiderate for him to have his servants to expect his arrival imminently at any moment and to just constantly be on edge waiting for him to show up. The idea is that there are those who are prepared to wait and be stationed at the right point, ready to open up and let him in. But other people are attending to other manners in the house. It's not like everybody's just simply waiting at the door so that a hundred people are yanking on the door to let the guy in, right? It's that others are trimming the lamps, meaning the torches all around the walls, the lamps and torches all around the upper portico of the house so that his house is well lit. Now, think about that. Why would that be? Well, as you end this little brief passage, when he's talking about if the homeowner had known at the time that which the thief would come, obviously people know that this person is perhaps something of a wealthy guy. If he's got servants that attend to him in this place where he lives and that, hey, he's gone. Uh, because he's at the wedding feast. How do we know that? Because his light house is usually lit at all hours of the night, except for when the time comes that he goes to bed. But for the last few nights, the torches haven't been lit around his house. Maybe that's because they're saving on some of the supplies, knowing that the master's not home and won't be back for a couple of days. So if he's out traveling, this will be a good time to wait in hiding. What if he comes home in the wee hours of the morning or the late hours at night under cover of darkness? This will be a great time to go in snatch that guy, mug him, rob him for everything that he has, right? But instead, if those servants are keeping the appearance as if the master is at home by keeping all of the lamps and torches and whatnot adequately lit so that light is surrounding the complex, then it would be a little bit more difficult for that burglar to sneak up on him, right? Because let's face it, he might be prepared at any moment. And the homeowner, if he's going to come home under the cover of darkness, would feel safer if he's stepping into a well-lit area. But that doesn't mean that security is all guaranteed, right? That's the reason why when he starts to bang on the door, immediately the servant on the other side opens up, lets him in so that the prowler doesn't have the opportunity to sneak out of the shadows and then have his way with the homeowner and steal everything that he has. That's what Jesus is saying of us, that we are to be ready, serving, waiting, because his arrival, his inspection of us, could be and is imminent, right? There may be some brief allusion or some small allusion to his imminent return at the end of the age, but more than likely these references are probably to what is going to transpire and Jesus uh, later in their future. And Jesus is referencing through the context of Luke 21, when he speaks of the armies encompassing Jerusalem, that Rome indeed would come and then the hammer would fall in AD 70. But at first it happened, it starts to show up in AD 66. And when that happens, that begins the process of the birth pangs. When they hear of the wars and rumors of wars and all these other signs begin to manifest, they see the dominoes being stacked up and ready to fall, per se, uh, so to speak. 
And when they see the armies approaching and they remember and recall the words that Jesus said, as history tells us through the words of Josephus, a non-believer and Jew at that, uh, along with the writings of people like Eusebius um, sometime later would tell us that those Christians who were in Jerusalem at the time when the Romans came and that brief moment when the Romans temporarily retreated away from the city as Vespasian left with his legions to go and claim the imperial crown, but left his son Titus in charge. Uh, and then eventually they wind up coming with what was left of Rome's armies and all the other mercenary forces from the ancillary nations around to finish the job that Vespasian started that eventually happens in AD 70, right? That that was that brief lull in the conflict where those Christians saw the armies come past. They're gone. We need to get out of here. Don't take anything. Now is the time. He said, hope that that time doesn't happen on the Sabbath. Pray that those women aren't pregnant or are not nursing their children at the time. That's going to make the journey harder. Harder. Flee to the mountains. Get away from the vicinity of Jerusalem because its destruction is nigh. It's right at hand, right? And so Jesus was coming in the clouds to judge the adulterous city of Jerusalem and all those covenant breakers that were responsible for betraying him and turning him over to the Gentiles to be brutally executed and murdered, having broken faith with God long before, having worshipped him under false pretenses, and again, rejecting Messiah. They earned that fate. And so what was Jesus saying? That up until that moment, you should be serving. Don't be just keeping a weathered eye on the sky waiting for me to return, but not focusing on the business of the house. You continue to do what I have left you in charge of. Serve faithfully. And when I come, you will be rewarded, right? And they were by having the mercy of being able to leave the city before the, the hammer ultimately fell. So what can we take away from that? It's just simply this, friends. Our time here is meant to serve. We have no reason to be anxious over anything. I mean, what would we say right now if we had a chance to communicate to our brothers and sisters that are locked up in work camps in China for being believers or are being martyred in Iran or press gain into hard labor uh, in North Korea because they're believers or going through re-education or training again in China and all other places where they're being persecuted by military or paramilitary forces or organizations that are just using terror tactics to try to scare and intimidate and frighten. Are we to tell them not to be anxious? Yes. Why? Because in the end, it doesn't matter. And do you think that they are edifying and building one another up through the encouragement of these very words that Jesus gave? Absolutely, because they realize, as we should, in the end, our lives have been forfeited to him. He is Lord. If we have bowed the knee and confessed him as Lord, then we owe him our entire allegiance, total loyalty and obedience. We have no say over our lives anymore, friends. Now, granted, he is respectful and oh so gracious to allow us the freedom to make these choices as to whether or not we will comply or not. But we are the ones that are missing out on the blessings, friend, not him. He will find those servants who are loyal and willing to obey. May that never be said of us. May we be the ones who are altogether willing to jump in without inhibition, throw caution to the wind, and fulfill our end of this covenant agreement in obeying him. Not just simply praising him with our lips, but or being hearers of the word, but doers as well. So thanks for listening. Uh, I hope that you've learned something from this, um, that there's something here for you to chew on. And again, I would encourage you, as Jesus often did his hearers, uh, he may not have said these words, but the intent is clearly there in those statements. And that is you do some digging. You go and seek what else Jesus has to say about this. You read and pray that the Holy Spirit would illuminate your understanding of this better so that in doing so, you understand what it is that Jesus requires of us and how we can, again, better serve him with the time that we have here. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that you will continue to burden and convict our hearts on how we can be obedient unto you and pleasing unto you through the exercising of the faith you have given us to let go of the things that uh, we have sunk our 
fingers into and are holding on to also oh tightly, that we have allowed to become the idols in our lives that distract us away from you, to not be anxious over anything, Lord, but to serve you. And all the way up until the time when we breathe our last, we close our eyes, and we are greeted in your warm embrace. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening.